Thanks very much, Lisa, and good evening and welcome, everybody, and thanks very much for coming along. It promises to be a really, really exciting uh, event tonight. Um, I will just say a few words about Mark, although when he gets up, you'll probably realise he doesn't need much of an introduction, but there are other elements to his, to his uh, activities and his past and so on that uh, I wasn't aware of, so I'll just run you a few, a few of those. Um, look, Mark is... Um, many things. He's an inventor, a writer, an entrepreneur, an educator and a broadcaster. And I heard him say just before, in fact, describing himself as, although others might have described him as this, as a digital ethnographer. What is that? That's one who studies, the, the, I guess, the cultural context and the social habits of those people who inhabit the digital realm. And that is essentially all of us, isn't it? Um, so, uh, Mark, uh, going back to 1994, Mark co uh, uh, co-invented VRML, which is a 3D interface to the World Wide Web, and since that time he's written five books, including, uh, most famously, The Playful World, How Technology is Transforming Our Imagination, uh, which used toys such as Furby and Sony's PlayStation to explore our interactive future. Mark's also been very involved as an educator. Um, he founded graduate programs in interactive media at the University of Southern California's Cinema School and at the Australian Film, Radio and Television School. Uh, Mark currently holds an appointment as an honorary associate in the University of Sydney's Digital Cultures Program. For the last seven years, um, and, and I'm sure this is where most people will know Mark from, he's been a panellist and judge on the ABC's uh, hit series, The New Inventors. Um, and then moving somewhat over to the darker side, he does regularly contribute to 2UE's weekend afternoon radio program, offering observations about the future of technology there. And Mark's articles about technology and culture are regularly published in the Sydney Morning Herald uh, on ABC's The Drum and ABC's Technology and Games. In 2006, Mark founded Future Street, um, a Sydney consultancy dedicated to helping clients negotiate all the challenges presented by this idea of the hyper-connected future and he currently serves as an advisor to a groundbreaking um, social influence analytics firm known as People Browse, which I believe is, is based out of California as well. So without further ado, would you please welcome Mark Pesci tonight. Good evening, everybody. I have to tell you that I am incredibly honoured to be here tonight. And I'm going to do one of my little black book lectures. Normally, my lectures are all very neatly typed up and everything. And sometimes, I'm just like, I'm going to use the black book. And I sit down, and I start writing and writing and writing. And what comes out is generally, well, it's a little different than what you might read if you've been to my blog. So the greatest changes that we experience in life they're often the ones that are the most invisible. They're invisible because they're too deep or because they're too big and they're too profound and if we looked upon them, our heads would explode. And that's when we turn away and we close that sort of psychic inner eye that would give us some insight into what's looming over us into what's pressing down on us, into what's forcing us to change. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Sounds scary. OK, let's be a little bit scared. It should sound a little bit scary, because the entire world has changed. The entire world is changing. The entire world is going to change a lot more. My first job tonight with you in this room is to open up some eyes, to make it clear exactly what's been happening. And I need to do that with a story, because that change started for me back in 1997. And the weird thing about that is that change started for me in 1997 in Australia. And I didn't live in Australia yet. But in 1997, I visited Australia. It was my first visit. I was invited to give a talk at the Internet World Conference. And so I got on a plane, flew to Sydney, and spoke at this conference, and actually had some friends whom I knew in Australia because they'd come through to visit me when I was living in America. And I got in touch with them, and they said, excellent, we'll go out drinking and dancing one night. Excellent. 
That sounds like a lovely idea. And we made plans. And I called my friend and he said, okay, here's what's going to happen. We're all going to meet up at Darling Harbor. If you've been to Darling Harbor in Sydney, it's perhaps the least enjoyable part of Sydney. <laughs> and we're going to meet in front of the IMAX theater, which is this massive building. And we're going to meet at 6.30 p.m. Excellent. Plans are laid. So rolls around. It's a couple of days later. And I'm there because my hotel is right next to it. So I walk out of the hotel, walk over, and there's a couple of my friends. We wait a couple more minutes, and a couple of my friends arrive. And there's a party, apparently, of 12 people who will be going on this, this expedition. But at 6.30, there's only six people. And we're a little bit screwed, because what are we going to do? We're, we're going to have to wait for them to arrive, or we're going to hive off, and there's just going to be two different parties. Except, now wait a minute, one of our friends pulls out a mobile phone and calls someone who's in the other group of people. Hey, where are you? Oh, okay. How long are you going to be? All right. Why don't you meet us over on Oxford Street? And that's what happened. And there was no crisis. And the evening proceeded perfectly. We don't even notice when that happens anymore. It's receded below the threshold of our awareness. The fact that no one is late anymore, just delayed, <laughs> we take that in stride. We take it as something that's given in 2011, even though what it means is that our lives are more closely coordinated than they have ever been in the modern era. We can coordinate more tightly than ever before, so much so that we now spend a lot of time feeling the abrasions as our overscheduled lives collide with other overscheduled lives. And we notice that this happens but we refuse to recognize the agency of that capability. Now, there's another sign of this change. It's a greater sign, and it's something that happened to me just last month. Now, I've made it a habit to go to the Royal Easter Show in Sydney, which is our big agricultural festival takes over Sydney Olympic Park. There's animals. There's wood chopping. I never saw wood chopping before. I am now a huge fan of wood chopping. <laughs> I am. There's rides. There's really bad food to eat. And I always make a, a date with my friends who have an eight-year-old. The eight-year-old is my cover because you know, I actually want to be there, but we take the eight-year-old. And as I'm leaving the house to meet them, because we're going to take the train over there, I turn my phone on. It's been off for some reason. And when I turn my phone on, it starts up, kind of. It's one of those whiz-bangy new smartphones. And then all of a sudden, it starts going bananas. It starts putting up messages. Can't load this, can't load that. Oh my goodness, what's happening to my phone? And so I turn it off and turn it on again, and exactly the same thing happens. And I turn it off and I turn it on again. And somewhere in here, there's this growing feeling in the pit of my stomach that I am suddenly screwed because I am now going to be the one person out of 40,000 people who is not reachable by mobile, which means I am now stuck with a really lousy conundrum. I can either attach myself like a barnacle to my friends and never be more than a couple of meters away from them, because otherwise they're lost in the crowd, or it's going to be complete chaos, and Mark is picked up by a policeman and sent to the lost children's booth. And you have that moment when you leave the house, and maybe you left the house in a hurry, and you realize that you forgot your mobile, and you have that flourish of panic. Something's not right. The cord's been cut. And suddenly, no one can hear you scream. <laughs> we rely on that connection. It's become our lifeline. It connects us to those who can offer us help. And without it, we're helpless. 
So why would anyone live without that connection? And indeed, Australia has answered that question definitively. I will ask a question. If you folks have been reading my blog, you'll know the answer. If you haven't, well, I'll know. What is the mobile subscription rate in Australia? What is the percentage of Australians who own mobile devices? Someone throw out some numbers. You're actually 115. So you were good by overestimating. It's probably going to be 190 before very long. All right. As of a year ago, it was 115%. Of course, that sounds insane. It's not actually insane because many people have a mobile for home and a mobile for the office, or they have like I, an iPad and a mobile. And we also have this exclude, these excluded ends where the, essentially parents will not give a mobile to a child below year three. <laughs> They do give mobiles to children in year three now. That's pretty much par. And for the most part, people over 80, not all of them, don't have mobiles or they don't use them very much. But in that vast middle section between 8 and 80 in Australia, basically everyone who lives within range of a mobile tower now has a mobile. And it's because of the reality of that connection, its immediate ability to provide the lifeline. And so it's become something that we expect to have. It's not a gadget. It's not bling. It's not the latest and greatest version of blah. It's exactly the opposite. It's something incredibly old. It's something incredibly ancient that's being retrieved, that we're getting back. Because we've always been able to turn to one another for help and for advice and for a kind word and just for a reminder of presence that you're there and not alone. But. Uh, we broke away from all of that in this rush to modernity. We broke apart when we built up the edifice of all of this nice technology and atomized into individual labor units and nuclear families and the whole Marxist critique of capital as alienation. And we spent a century, more or less, that's a little sloppy either way, we spent a century broken down and falling apart. But now, now we get back to what originally was. And this is a lovely quote from T.S. Eliot. We shall not cease from exploration. And at the end of our exploration will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time, because we have reconnected. And who wouldn't want to be connected? Who would not choose the company of others over solitude? And so this decision is repeated, first a few times, and then several, and then many, and then soon into the thousands and the millions and well beyond. And at some point, all the fun that we're having here, getting all close together, well, it also happened there. And by there, you can substitute any place, however alien, whether that's Brazil or Burma or Baluchistan. And I want to illustrate this point with three stories. The Kerala coast of India, so that's the South Indian coast facing out into the Indian Ocean, has had fishermen working on it for thousands of years. They go out very early in the morning, 3, 4 a.m. They drop their nets. They say a prayer to the gods. The nets come up. Hopefully, they're full of fish. Mid-morning, they're ready to turn their boats around and head back into port. And for all of the last thousands of years, those fishermen have been confronted with a bit of a dilemma. 
there's a whole bunch of different ports that they can pull into to sell their fish. Here is the problem. Inevitably, too many fishermen would pull into one port to sell their fish, and the fishermen wouldn't get a good price for their fish. And inevitably, there would be a port just a few kilometers away, and there would be no fishermen in that port, and there would be no fish available at any price. And then in 1997, India deregulated its telecoms industry, and mobile towers started popping up everywhere. And the thing about it in India is you don't have to have a clearance to put up a mobile tower somewhere. You can just throw something up, bam, there it is. And so all of India now gets dotted with mobile towers, including on the Kerala coast. And it turns out that if you put a mobile tower right next to the coast, the signal goes out about 20 kilometers. And at some point, some rich fishermen, because a mobile was incredibly expensive in India, that was a month's income to a Carolan fisherman, at some point, there's a fisherman out to sea with a phone, and they get a call, and they talk, and maybe over the course of this conversation, this fisherman learns that there's a port that needs fish that day. And they take their boat into that port, and they make a good profit. And then the next day, when that fisherman is out, he calls into port and figures out which port needs fish. And the fishermen all start talking to each other, and pretty soon, all of the fishermen all over the Kerala coast all have mobiles and are all calling in, and all of a sudden, all of the fishermen are going to the right ports. And all of the ports have just the right amount of fish. And the fishermen are earning so much more money that this device that costs them a month's income is now being paid for in two months' time. And in Kenya, if you are a farmer selling vegetables and you have a nice crop of something and you're about to take it to market, you can dial into a service and that service will tell you the price of your particular vegetable at all of the markets near you so that you can then take your vegetables to the market that will give you the best price for your vegetables on any given day. So much so that the price of owning a mobile, the price of making a call or sending a few text messages is nothing next to the additional income that you're making. And third, if you are a barber in Karachi, generally what you have to do is you have to rent a shop somewhere people will be going by and hang your shingle and get ready to cut people's hair. It's a very expensive proposition. But if you live in Karachi in 2011, what you do is you buy yourself a bicycle, you get a mobile phone, you get some signs printed that say, hi, I'll come and visit you and cut your hair, and you put your mobile number on it and you stick the signs up all over the neighborhood. And all of a sudden, people are calling you to make appointments for you to come by and cut their hair. And your clients are happy because they get home service, and you're happy because you don't have to pay a big fat rent, and everybody's happy. The power of connectivity has always been intertwined with economics, has always been closely connected to the lore of money. But until now, it was very difficult to see the relationship clearly. But what's happened is this relationship is suddenly so revealed that what we now understand is that the mobile and the connection it brings is the most potent economic amplifier since the metal axe head. And for that reason, it becomes impossible to resist it. Because to resist it would be stupid. It would be self-defeating. This is so much the case that somewhere in the next couple of days, say the next two weeks, we're going to cross the line to six billion mobile subscribers. That's on a planet with seven billion people. Now, counting the number of duplicates there are, what that means is that something greater than 75% of the human race is all connected. They're all together now. Now, my favorite science fiction writer, William Gibson, once said, and a quote that gets used a lot and becomes a guiding idea. He said, 
The future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Well, in this case, now, the future is here, and it's here for all of us all at once. But very few of us know it because we're too busy uh, staring down and connecting. Now, as you all know, on the 11th of March, magnitude 9.0 earthquake hit the coast off the Sendai Prefecture in Japan. And what the quake didn't bring down, the 10-meter tsunami inundated. And everything from hundreds and hundreds of caves along Japan's northeastern coast was laid waste including a few things that were supposed to be indestructible. In particular, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, of which we now know, as of this week, Reactor 1 has suffered a complete and catastrophic core meltdown. We haven't gotten close enough to reactors 2 or 3 to know. But we know that there's been at least one. So this is the worst nuclear accident since Chernobyl 25 years ago. And it's spread a penumbra of radioactive contamination across thousands of square kilometers of Japanese countryside. It's led to an exclusion zone that's 30 k's in radius. And that's, I did the math, that's 2,000 something k's. But of course, it's actually even worse than that because some of that contamination has escaped into the air and some of it has escaped into the sea and it enters the water and the rain and the spinach and the tuna and all of it has been affected. And there's no telling. There's no telling what's good and what's bad. There's no telling what's safe and what's deadly. Because the Japanese government was simultaneously overwhelmed and eternally cautious, and has not been forthcoming with any measurements or statistics that would help people decide for themselves what to do and where to do it and when it is safe to do it. And had this been, say, a quarter century ago, as in Ukraine, people might have gone about blithely unaware against all of the radioactive background for days, even weeks, suspecting nothing at all until a pregnancy or a cancer diagnosis. But we're all connected now. Even more so in Japan. Japan has the most advanced mobile infrastructure on the planet. They pride themselves on this. And connected people communicate. It's inherent. You don't have to teach someone to do that. It just happens. You might start with hello and uh, maybe some lines about the weather but it'll move on eventually to matters of substance, topics important, whispered fears, blasted hopes. And in that moment, there's some consolation because it's easier to be afraid together, although it is easier to panic together. But the pressure lifts when we share it. And someone must have wondered, idly, if we can observe the weather, rain or shine, why not the radiation? And, and could there be weather reports from points near and far telling us all about the invisible rain of alpha, beta, gamma, so we could don the appropriate foul weather gear? And from this, 
Safecast was born. Now, it's a website. It's nothing more than a website. It invites everyone who visits it to make their own observations of the radiation around them in Japan right this minute, and then invites them to share that information, to add their data to the data that other people are collecting and have collected for the last two months everywhere throughout Japan. I mean, the idea is very simple. People armed with Geiger counters and radiation dosimeters, they become the army collecting the information the Japanese government cannot or will not provide. And if this information scares, so be it. Now, this is called crowdsourcing. It's the connected, collaborative actions of vast numbers of people who might not even know each other, but are aimed toward a common purpose. And it was always difficult to happen. It was always too difficult for it to break out spontaneously, except in a few very rare moments. And those moments proved that it has always lurked right underneath the skin of human culture. But it needed our connectivity to be released. Now, in Japan, they worry about radiation sickness. In America, well, Americans, in their perpetual libertarian paranoia, they worry about the long arm of the law. And what concerns them is something that they see as a gross infringement on their natural liberties, RBT checkpoints. <laughs> you can purchase a number of different smartphone apps which will allow you to record the location of an RBT checkpoint. Or, after you've had a few, and you're ready to get behind the wheel and do some drink driving, you can open up the app and find out exactly what routes to avoid so that you don't hit a checkpoint. Now, politicians, <laughs> politicians have been screeching and declaiming the immorality of these sorts of things, all while carefully ignoring the elephant in the room. The power of people connected. People connected in their numbers simply overwhelm, outperform, and thrust aside all obstacles, whether they're cultural or legal, that you can put in their way. And this is where we are right now. This is the edge of the present. But, uh, Let's pull back just a little bit from the extremes of life and death and have a look at something that's more prosaic. But it is just as profound. Wikipedia. Wikipedia is 10 years old. Wikipedia has changed the way that we come to know things. So much so that you're probably like, oh yeah, Wikipedia. But more than this, Wikipedia has changed the way we make knowledge. This crowdsourced, peer-produced, from each according to their ability, to each according to their need, Wikipedia was not supposed to work. Wikipedia was supposed to implode in noise, and lies, and endless arguments about how many angels could dance on the head of Richard Dawkins. <laughs> and has instead become the singular reference work, the common connected touchstone for a connected species. And now, 
we get to the audience participation portion of tonight's program, which I have called the experiment. Because I want to see if we can replicate some of that magic in Wikipedia right here tonight. Every one of you at your tables, and I think up there as well, you all have post-it pads, and there's a pen and a post-it pad. Here's what I want you to do. Every person at this table, what I want you to do. You all are South Australians. You probably sort of would all consider yourselves Adelaideans. And so we're going to do a knowledge sharing task around Adelaide. And what I would like you to do is that I would like you to spend about a minute thinking of something that you can tell us about Adelaide, ideally something that maybe not too many other people would know, that we might be delighted to learn, something that you know that's in your head. I want you to do that, and I want you to write that in a couple of sentences, one, two, maybe three sentences, on the post-it pad. When you've done that, please put your post on one of the easels that are up here at the front of the room. Can you do that? Are there any questions? Is that clear enough? All right, I'm going to give you about three, four minutes to do that, and please just start coming up and sticking your pads up there. Okay, now that they're all up there, it's time for you to have a look at the things that you can learn by sharing your knowledge about Adelaide. So, as in whatever order that will not cause a riot that will kill people, if you folks want to flow up and have a look at these two and the ones up there, if you folks want to pop down and have a look, please feel free. I want you to do this. You all really do need to have a look at them. All right, I will insist. Because I'm going to tell you a little secret now. Here's the secret. Before you folks got here, before most of you got here, I took five of the people in the room and I took them aside and I said, this is what we're going to do. And what I need you to do is I need you to write something up and I need you to write a believable lie. So some of these are not true. Some of them are. You'll see a red pen. You'll see a red pen at the easel. If you think something is obviously not true, would you put a mark on it with a red pen, please? I want to see if, you, if your detectors are good. What if you already lied? If you what? Well, then it's Wikipedia, and we'll just go on. It's fine. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's spend about the next five minutes doing that. And after that, I will have the five contributors reveal themselves, and we'll take a look at see if you folks could actually sniff out the truth in the fiction. Hey, fo folks, Lisa has just told me that we will be taking photos of these and putting them up on the, f on the Flickr. So don't worry if you don't quite get a look in. All right, so we've got about two more minutes. Are any of them getting particularly marked up? All right. Let's start to move back to your seats if you can, so we can keep the show rolling along. And when you're all seated down, I will uh, invite the, my co-conspirators to reveal themselves. 
and we'll see if uh, you cut any of them out. I mean, this is a difficult task because saying something that's almost the truth, that's believable, is a little more difficult than spinning a whopper, isn't it? You know, a whopper you can pull out of thin air. But to uh, make a believable truth, a believable lie, you almost have to be a politician. All right. Everyone's got their seats again, more or less. Okay. Would the five of you please stand and find your little cards? Yes, the five co-conspirators. There we are. There's the five of you. All right. Let's see. Let me, let's leave it on the board, all right? I'll leave it on the board. All right. No one even noted that. No, okay. no Oh, so this has a, an X for, for maybe being wrong. So someone noted that. What about yours? No, nothing on that. Okay. All right. And, uh, and where's yours? Oh, so yours is still on the true board. Oh, is this the false board? All right. And what about yours, did, sir? Did yours make the dodgy board or the good true board? We don't know. All right. Okay. So... It's interesting. So you found 50% maybe? <laughs> exactly. Okay, great. Thank you all very much. And thank them very much because that was not an easy job. Um, I guess what we will do, what we could do then is pull, make, let's, let's make sure if you were a liar, let's pull them separately so that those can be documented on uh, the flicker as well as the lies. Now, uh, I flew in on the afternoon flight from Sydney on Qantas. And I want you to suppose that there were two people on that flight with me who had never been to Adelaide before. And we took one of them, and we took them into this room, and we let them learn from all of the knowledge and all of even the falsity that you folks have supplied on your various cards this evening. And the other one, we'll just leave the other one to their own devices. Now. All other things being equal, which is probably going to have a better time in Adelaide? Which is probably going to be better able to avoid the pitfalls and to revel in what the city has to offer? Of course, it's the person that we invited in here to learn from everything that you folks had to offer, even with the bad bits leavening the good because this knowledge works. It can be put to work immediately, improving everything. And take what's going on in this room and multiply it 25,000 times, because that's the difference between the 150 or so of you here and the 3.6 million articles that are in Wikipedia. Wikipedia, which is imperfect. Wikipedia, which contains lies. And some of them are deliberate and malicious lies. Most of them are simply made in the ignorance of love. But uh, with enough truth, and in truth we have more than enough, it overwhelms the mistakes and the errors and the revisionism and the sanitation of knowledge. And so again, let's repeat that same experiment with two people lately arrived on planet Earth. And what we're going to do is we're going to hand one of them a magical little device about the size of a mobile. That's about right. And uh, with that device, 
this person can access any bit of fact that they might need when they need it wherever they would need it. The other poor fellow we're going to leave to his own devices. Who fares better? Who makes better decisions? Who is more successful? All things being equal, the connected outdistances the disconnected peer. And that is what has started to happen to us. We use Wikipedia to help us make decisions. Better decisions than we could have otherwise made. And because of that, because we see the value in that, we are more likely to use Wikipedia in the future to help us make even better decisions. And we see the value of that. And so we more frequently turn to Wikipedia and we're caught up in a feedback loop. And as it grows tighter, the boundary between this and that dissolves. And we redefine ourselves. We become something new that is no longer this and that, but just this. And this is not about Wikipedia. I could have used Safecast or RBT Checkpoint software or something else that I want to tell you about now called Suki. If you are rioting in London and you want to stay away from the police who are trying to kettle you, you use Suki on your mobile phone so that you can locate all of the policemen and you can tell your rioting compatriots about the rioting policemen who are trying to stop you from rioting. It's all very neat and very efficient and it's giving the police the dickens because all of a sudden the protesters are better connected than the cops are. <laughs> and so this isn't about Wikipedia or Suki or Safecast. It's about anything that allows us to use our hyper-connectivity to share knowledge. And from that shared knowledge, to create hyper-intelligence. And then, from that hyper-intelligence put to work, take a big boost in our own individual effectiveness into hyper-empowerment. And this is happening everywhere that you care to look closely enough. Because this is the natural and inevitable consequence of wiring six billion minds together. And it's unstoppable. Not because of Wikipedia or Safecast or Suki or anything else. It's because of us. You see, we all want it. We all want to be hyper-empowered. And that's the consequence of the connection. So everything, everywhere in the world, is starting to refigure itself around this new connectivity. Billions are spent, hundreds of billions, for something that wasn't even a fantasy a generation ago. I've come to think of it like this. I'm friends with a science fiction author named Werner Vinge. And Vinge wrote a novel, big tome of a book, about a thousand pages, 20 years ago. And this book is almost entirely set in outer space. And so how do you tell time in outer space? Because there's no sunrise, there's no sunset. And so he decided that, in fact, rather than having hours and minutes and all that crazy stuff, these folks were simply going to tell time by seconds. So this one second, we're all familiar with what that is. And then there's a kilosecond, that's about 15 minutes. And then there's a megasecond, and that's about a fortnight. And then there's a gigasecond, and that's about 32 years. 
I want you all to imagine yourselves sitting in the middle of a billion seconds. Sixteen years ago, hardly anyone was connected. Sixteen years from now, being connected will be synonymous with being human. That's not a prediction. That's where we are. And it's as plain as the nose on our faces if we only stop to notice what's happening. But before you start to hear the peal of church bells, which I know happens a lot in the city of churches, and before we all stand up and break out into the Internationale, I want to point out that being connected does not make us all of one mind. Far from it. Everyone seeks advantage. Everyone seeks advantage from what they know and from who they know. And that will not end. Rather, it's being amplified. Eleven. It's being amplified as we take our hyperconnectivity and apply that to the people that we know and convert that hyperconnectivity into hyperintelligence and then into hyper empowerment so that who you know becomes how powerful you are now it has ever been thus but now game is open all sorts of players are at the table. They have a seat now because they are connected. And so the world that we walk into in the next half billion seconds is the bellum omnia contra omnis, the war of all against all. You and yours banded together, connecting and sharing against them and theirs. Who is better connected? Who is sharing more effectively? Those who do win. And this is the real reason there's no escape, because our survival depends on it. The further in we go, the deeper we get, the more empowered we become. And each step along this path increases our selection fitness, to a steal a phrase from the evolutionary biologists. And there is no way to step away from this, not and survive. So we're forcing one another into a rapid change. This is evolution in an instant of time, which will look to future generations a lot like a singularity of about a billion seconds in duration. It's probably not entirely different from the birth of language that we now know happened on the plains of Southwest Africa perhaps a hundred thousand years ago. That was when we began an ascent into mind sharing. And now we can see its culmination, even if we cannot yet imagine the humanity who arrives there. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Lucy. Yep. Thanks uh, very much, Mark. Um, we'll, open the, uh, we'll open the floor to questions, um, but I'd like to perhaps get things rolling um, uh, for, those, you know, for those of you who want to think about a question. Um, Mark, I'd like to ask you, um, first of all, <coughs> you mentioned a figure of 75% uh, of the human race currently uh, interconnected or connected with each other. Right. Um, so logically, we're moving towards a point, whether it be in the, at the other end of this billion seconds within 16 years. Um, that was a gigasecond, wasn't it? It's yeah. a gigasecond. Yeah, 32, 32 yeah, I call years. it a billion seconds. Yeah. Billion seconds, okay. So presumably we're moving towards a point where we're going to get as close as possible to 100% right. connectivity in the human race. Now, of course, all, there'll always be holdouts. There'll be people for political reasons. There'll be areas of chronic poverty where people are, uh, don't have access to these. No, types but of see, the, the interesting thing is the chronic poverty argument. It's the poorest people who are receiving the most benefit from mobiles, and that's why there's been such a rapid uptake. Mm -hmm. So it, it. Okay, so let's so let's let's say yeah. that okay, then there won't be those those pockets then. But okay, so we're moving towards let's say 98, 99 percent connectivity. Right. <clears throat> it seems to me though you you took a quote from T. S. Eliot before about returning to the to the to the point where we began. Right. But when we reach a point of 100 percent connectivity, we're not actually at the point where we began because we may have had 100 percent connectivity within uh, smaller social groups. Right thousands and thousands of years in the past, but we've never actually come to a point in human history where everybody on the whole planet is connected. Correct. So, I mean, would you like to perhaps tease out some thoughts about what that potentially means sociologically, neurologically, politically, and so on? I mean, I know we could talk for hours about it, but we reach a, a, a condition of the human, as the human being in terms of its brain and in terms of its social condition, which is completely... Um, Unlike any other any other point in our human history, so what happens from that point onwards? Well, we're already seeing. I mean, we're talking about the, the human brain. The human brain cannot evolve quickly. All right, it evolves over the course of hundreds of thousands of years. But the prosthetics that are in use around the human brain are evolving very rapidly. So the calculator, no one does long division anymore. Mm. Kids learn it in school, and that's pre that's pretty much it. And God bless that because long division stinks. Mm. And um, and so so we're pushing various cognitive functions, things that took up gray matter into uh, the physical realm or into the, the ether, whatever you want to call it. So there's a calculator function, there's the factish function, which Wikipedia is taking up. Then there's data collection around a whole bunch of different domains. So Safecast is a, a, a version of that. The RBT checkpoints are a version of that. Suko, uh, Suki is a version of that. And so they're, what they're all doing is they're basically taking um, a a, 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 a strand of our concentration. I want to pay attention to this. And it then becomes a negotiation between the brain and the machines and all of the other brains that are, con that are doing that. And that's, you know, it's not what we would have thought a hive mind looks like. I mean, we still don't really know. But it is, in fact, how a hive mind ends up behaving. So we're going to see, and so the, the future is simply, not simply, but is that to the nth degree, that that becomes the pervasive mode as opposed to the exceptional mode. If we take the example of, you're saying uh, people don't do long division anymore, so we, we just, uh, essentially we're outsourcing um, functions of the human brain to mechanical instruments. Right. So rather than us bothering about long division, a computer does it. Now the other day you, I heard you talking on the radio about the, the green goose and about the, the, the little, um, and you can explain to people what that is because I, I haven't got my head around it myself, but a little device which, would, which you could put on your water bottle so that you knew how much water you drank during the day. And right. most people would say, well I can surely just judge that myself. But we then outsource, if you like, that function of measuring something as simple as that. So does that then free up other areas of the brain for much higher level well, you'd want that, or it's people watching more television. And this is, and this is, you know, and Clay Shirky talks about the cognitive surplus, and you know, when we get that, when we get that freed up potential, does that then allow us? It gives us the option. You know, it's like money gives you options; it doesn't necessarily buy you anything. So it's the same thing that we're buying options. In the same way, I mean, I understand. Hearing people talk about it, the greatest labor-saving device of the 20th century was the washing machine, specifically for the women, because it just made washing 
it's not this dig along task, but something you just sort of ran off and, yes. and it comes back. And then you have that time free to be able to do what you will with. So I think that that's one way of looking at it, is that it frees up that, that time. But also, it was, it was impossible for you to know the radiation levels around Japan before this, or to know 3.6 million factoids about whatever. And so there are things that are also coming into our apprehension that were simply impossible before. So there's a bit of both. It's, it's that, yes, you will have the time free to be able to focus on your higher level things, whatever your genius wants you to express. Um, at the same time, there's going to be types of attention that you'll be able to maintain that were simply impossible to maintain before. Just as, just as uh, going back to your example of the gigasecond and, 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 and uh, 16 years ago, having the conversation that we're having here with the technology that surrounds us and so on was completely unimaginable Correct. 16 years ago. As a, and I, don't, I know you don't like to be termed a, a futurist, mm. uh, um, it's a living. Is it? <laughs> well, well, I mean, would you, I mean, you could sit here tonight and say, okay, well, this is based on the way things are moving. This is how we project things will be 60 years from now. What are the possibilities that would be completely different from that? Oh, well, there, you know, there's all sorts of possibilities for civilizational collapse. The interesting thing is, is that, you know, you could have a, an energy collapse. You could have a world war. Um, you could have a plague. You could have all these different things happening. The interesting thing about this is that we're just starting to flex our capabilities around these shared capabilities around hyper empowerment. Mm -hmm. And if we get presented with a really interesting challenge, um, it may be possible, uh, it's likely that we will put our hyper empowerment to work mm -hmm. around, for instance, if there was suddenly a massive energy shock, mm -hmm. what I expect would happen is that people would then immediately start to share a lot of information around conservation, mm -hmm. which is what they're doing in Japan right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. All right. And they have really good tools for being able to do this. So, I, I don't think we're ever going to run away from it. If we, if we woke up tomorrow and Wikipedia had fallen into a black hole and just no longer existed and Jimmy Wales was being held somewhere for ransom, the first thing that we would do would be to recreate it because we understand what it is. Wikipedia is not so much a thing as it is a penny drop, all right, that it is simply, oh, wait, we can just do this and we'll go and do it. It may take us a little while to re recreate the corpus, but it, that's just a matter of time. It's not a matter of reinventing the wheel. Mm -hmm. The wheel is out there now. Mm -hmm. So how many of the unknown unknowns are there? Mm -hmm. um, so far, this has been a study in unknown unknowns. Mm -hmm. what, the thing that I worry the most about at night is what do individuals do when they're hyper-empowered? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, because individuals now get the power that even nation states didn't have to be able to disrupt or to be able to manipulate. You know, bo I think both of those powers go hand in hand and we will see more and more examples of this. They will become commonplace. Now, what that means is that we as individuals will then figure out how to work in groups to be able to blunt the effects of that. And so that again becomes another kind of arms race, another kind of selection, another kind of evolution toward ends. But we're going to see some, it depends on what, I, I, you, I don't know if you're going to call it acts of war, individual acts of war, mm -hmm. because whether or not you take hyperconnectivity into account, the power of a single individual to wreak havoc has increased pretty much mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. And we've just sort of hit an asymptote there. Mm -hmm. and, and so this is sort of the yawing, it's the yawing pit before us. And, it will take a lot of human kindness, but also a, a lot of human thought mm. and shared thought around this to help us to keep this somewhat bottled. Mm. All right, and I don't mean bottled in the sense of blunting it. I mean bottled in the sense of being able to contain it when it goes off. Mm. Mm. So protecting ourselves almost from our own potential, yes. We'll, we'll, we'll turn it over to the audience now. I'm sure people have got some questions. Um, yes. I guess we're making you come up to the microphone. Mm. Sorry. And then here, and we do have people upstairs as well, so please. Uh, yeah. Make yeah, sure you were talking about uh, hyper intelligence. There's also you're talking about the problem of hyper stupidity. Yes. So, uh, for example, there's the riot, like you're talking about the riots in London. Yes. So I was at those riots because I was working in Soho. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, like one friend of a friend, you know, we got arrested for arson. Uh, so uh, there's riots all over the world, the right. first world and the second world. So right. uh, good and bad ideas, and some of those riots 
are kind of reductive. Yes, absolutely. They're uh, whistling their way to the graveyard. Yeah, but, but then so is, you know, checking RBT checkpoints, right? I mean, it's counterproductive in the longer term because you may kill somebody or kill yourself, but people will still use their hyper-empowerment to whatever ends that they deem important, not to whatever ends the culture deems important. Right, so Marx and, you know, communism, some of the ideas, you know, because there was mass media at the beginning of the last century, some good ideas and bad ideas both spread rapidly. Yeah, absolutely, and they now spread more rapidly, and we now have this interesting mix of good ideas and bad ideas up here, and it's very hard for us to tell them apart. Thanks, over here. Thanks for your talk, it was great. Um, very interested to hear about the um, CCAST um, right. website. Safecast. Um, sorry, Safecast. Um, how, do you, how do you imagine this um, whole idea of connectivity um, might help solve some of the um, world's big environmental problems that we face at the moment, such as climate change, um, and I guess the other big one is the depletion of fish stocks in terms yeah. of you know, minds being connected together and recording and observing. and. Yeah. Um, we need to think about human beings as sensors. And I don't mean that in a purely mechanical sense, but it, it, it is, the, you know, in another 10 years, because of the, the, the various trends that are going on, sensors are going to be so cheap that we won't even worry about them. We'll spread them everywhere and we'll be able to watch fish stocks and we'll be able to watch pollution and all this and we won't need to be there. Right now, we kind of need to be there. But we're so well connected that we can be there and it's the same thing as having the sensors there. And so people need to be coming up with good ideas. Now, good ideas are not enough because in order to make something catch, it has to be a good idea that enough other people are interested in. All right, so it has to, so there's, you don't get to decide what a good idea is. You don't get to decide what the cause, the environmental cause worth working on is. That's a consensus-based process. People are learning how to work that consensus-based process. I don't know that it's ever going to be possible to force that. All right, so you'd be able to say, okay, these are the areas that I nominate are worth having people spending their cognitive time working on. But you then have to be persuasive with rhetoric and whatever else to be able to bring them in and to get them to self-sustain. Wikipedia has been able to do this. Safecast has been able to do this. There's a lot of examples of this. Suki has been able to do this because people want to, you know, smash the state and fight the police. We do have a question from up the top. Thank you for the talk. Um, I've got a question about a potential downside, and that is being constantly connected, being constantly surrounded by information. A lot of that information is not in your best interest. Yeah. It's shaped, it's, it's yeah. targeted, it's marketed, it's, out, it's outright lies. Yeah. And my particular concern is people who have never known anything else who are trying to reach maturity and find their identity surrounded by lies. There's two questions here, and I want to deal with them independently. The first is that we, we have gone in just a little bit more than five years from a culture where we were never connected to a culture of continuous connection, and we suck at this. We do not have yet the skills to understand when or how or why it is appropriate to disconnect and to go into disconnected spaces. There are individuals who do. Most of us, just as a culture, stink, and we're passing along those behaviors to our children because they're simply watching us do what we do. All right, um, so that's something that we all, and we're, I'm giving us a pass, because again, this is brand new for everybody, all right? But I'm raising the issue that we, need, we now need to think as individuals, as ethicists, as moralists, as educators, as parents, as mentors, we need to think about this as a whole, and think about the fact that the need for disconnected time is as important and as vital to the soul as connected time, because the soul actually needs time to itself. All right, it needs reflection, and you cannot be reflection, reflective if you're being responsive. They are, they are antagonistic qualities. All right, that's the first half of that. The second thing, which is talking about truth and lies, is that, as they would say with Wikipedia, you would never rely on a single source. Okay, and so the individuals who will be able to do the best here will be the individuals who will be able to create knowledge networks which will be able to help them quickly ascertain the truth of any fact that's presented to them, whether that's relying on resources or being able to go out to the network of people, which I think is going to be the more reliable source around them. Hey, I just found this out. Oh no, this is BS and here's why. Or hey, I just found this out. Yes, this is true and here's why. 
All right, or yes, I think this is probably true and here's an explanation for it. And so it really is when you're in a, in a world where there are forces who are attempting to sway you by lying, what you need to then do is build up the network. And the network is more of a human component than a machine component and use that to be able to then power your way into some rough estimation of what the truth is. Yes, sorry, Lisa. You I'm just asking some questions that have come from the live yes. stream. So we have Angie from Queensland. Um, can, Mark, can you give your opinion on solitude and imagination? Uh, knowledge, the difference between knowledge and information versus free and original thinking. Yeah. And the second question from Riamasan, which is, will universal connectivity imply universal sharing of data? And does yeah. that imply the end of privacy? Yeah, and the answer to the second one is no. Um, okay, so for the, for the first one, I, I actually did touch on this, that this idea of disconnected space, quiet and solitude, that we all have different modes of being. And it really was that the, the default mode was this, you know, even if we were surrounded by other people, it was more or less disconnected and it was easy to find solitude and quiet. It is increasingly difficult to do this, in part because we've actually found a real joy in connection, all right? And, and, we, and we can own that. That's okay, all right? It's a new thing, it's a great toy, and it brought the world closer to us. It brought the world closer to our hearts. That's a good thing. But too much of a good thing is not a good thing. And so we do need to be able to think about the requirements there around solitude and reflection and how that can be a good thing. Um, I try to practice this and I stink at it. Uh, you know, it's very hard for me and I've actually learned over the last several months when I need to close Twitter, all right? Not just because I'm trying to write, but actually because it's making me upset and it's only inflaming me to keep it open because it's, it's becoming an emotional conduit. And, and so I'm, I'm learning but I consider myself a guinea pig here. And the problem is, is that unfortunately everyone else is being a guinea pig too. And I haven't really been able to file any reports about what the guinea pigness has done yet. This is an issue that I think we all need to think about. This is an issue that I'm starting to raise now when I talk to people, but particularly when I talk to educators around the idea of connected hygiene. All right, the second question was privacy. Anyone who tells you that privacy is over has a vested interest in your revealing everything to them. Remember that and never forget it. Okay? Without private life, there is no private thought. And without private thought, there is nothing. You, you are not an individual anymore. Um, what we had as privacy, again, we're talking about this idea of retrieval. What we had as privacy in the tribal unit was very different than the privacy that we think of as being modern privacy. You know, there was no privacy to the body per se. Everyone's very familiar with everyone else. Everyone knows everyone's personal history, but there's a privacy to your thought, all right? And, and, and that is sort of where we're, we're, we're now attempting to draw a line about how private do I need to be inside, and yet we're invited to share our thoughts on Twitter or on a blog or on Facebook or whatever it might be. And we realize that every time we do this, we are trading, and it's a legitimate trade, but we're trading a part of our internality for this external connection. Again, no right answer here, but we need to understand that that trade is always being made. Thanks, Mark, for a great presentation. And um, thank you for lying. Uh, with, with all, <laughs> how did you know? Uh, um, with all this hyper-connectivity, do you think it's actually making people more individualistic or less individualistic? I ask that question because this week is the uh, birthday of Buddha, who basically, uh, in part of his teachings, taught that it's an illusion that we're individuals. Mm. We're not separated from each other. Mm. And uh, I just thought it was an interesting thought. You know, I'm not really, haven't really thought it through, but I just thought it was an interesting question. Mm. <laughs> it is, it's an essay question. <laughs> um, Doesn't it touch on the T.S. Eliot quote before as well about returning to the point of origin? And yeah, well, it touches on that entire, it touches on the entire four quartets because it's sort of the four quartets dances around exactly this point. I just, I reread the whole thing this week as I was writing this talk. Um, the, 
There are two, yeah, I, th I think like any good answer, there's probably gonna be two sides to this. One is that it does reveal, the sharing does reveal the more commonness. It's harder to be alienated from someone, although it's very easy to be mean to someone that you haven't met in the flesh. We all know that from being online. But it's also easier to discover the commonality that you might have with someone in Iraq or someone in South Africa or whatever because you can read their stories or hear their stories or call them up on Skype and talk to them. So there's that element there that we're discovering a shared humanity that really was never possible before or always came to us in a highly edited form. And so there's that. And that's going to be a good thing and a bad thing. At the same time, it also allows communities of particular interest positive and negative to find themselves and to sort of crawl off to the nth degree with each other and to really differentiate themselves around I'm really interested in Federation porcelain produced by this, you know, you know, and, and they can really invest themselves in their differentness. Even if there's a group of them, they're being different together. But the, so, so I think there's both of those things that are happening simultaneously around that. Um, so I don't know if that's a wash or, or whatever. Uh, I would like to think that um, it would be possible to hold this mirror up and see the illusion of the self, but I think that's a big ask. Right. Part of, part of the, <clears throat> in all this debate, there's obviously part of the fascination, part of the challenge, part of the excitement, also part of the, the, the danger, if you like, as well, is that we are in the unique position that we are the generation which is Correct. experiencing the birth of the internet and, and this, this transition from zero connectivity or very little connectivity to what will soon be 100% connectivity. Correct. So within, in terms of the overall sort of evolution of the, of the human species, we are living this very moment in time. We're very lucky. Tremendous um, evolution both in yeah. technology Although and lucky may not be that. I mean, well, that's it. 16 years from now we may go. You know, that, I don't know if that that's was why, luck. That's why I say, obviously, there's a danger inherent as well. I mean, yeah. to an extent, we're making it up as we go along, aren't we? Because this to is... To an extent? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, yeah I, I, I think we're completely making it up. I mean, you know, science fiction authors have nibbled at this for a mm. hundred years. Um, but we really don't have any good guides to this, except possibly in, in more mystical literature. And I mean, you know, this, this, this is the Royal Institute, so there's something that needs to be very evidence-based and scientific here. And we don't have a lot of evidence and science yet around what the qualitative effects of connectivity are. And this is part of why my, I enjoy my work so much, because I feel like I get to be out there, you know, I get to be the ethnologist, the, the, I just get to make field notes. Look at this is what's going on, this is what's going on, and I get to share them with you. Because this is actually happening not just in you know, Kerala and Kenya and uh, Karachi, but it's happening every point of the map now all the time. And, and so we can see the emergence of a new culture. And I get to study that as avidly as if I'd been transported to some South Sea Island 100 years ago and started to go, wow, this is what these crazy natives are doing. But we're, we are the crazy natives. And so there's a lot of weirdness and there's a lot of unpredictability and there's a lot of um, confusion. You know, confusion is all right as long as you admit it. That's the thing. I think it's when people launch into the future thinking this is the way things are going to be, um, that's when you get into trouble. And there are plenty of historical <laughs> uh, examples of that, yes. Um, can we have, we're getting very close to the end, so we have another question perhaps? I guess so. What related is to the to the earlier question about the um, sort of balance between individual interest and and, and the hyper the the group interest that comes out of the hyper connectivity. Right. Um, I was, is there a way of uh, is there a way of measuring that? And perhaps you kind of answered that earlier. Is uh, are there any attempts to measure that? Um, is there an equilibrium in there somewhere? So, so psych psychoanaly psychoanalytically, there are. Um, you want to read Sherry Turkle. Sherry Turkle just wrote a book called Alone Together. Now, Sherry Turkle is, in some sense, the, the mother, rather than saying the father of my field, because she's a psychoanalyst who's been studying the interaction between specifically children, but she's now gone into you know, just normal-aged people, and technology, specifically computers. And she's been doing this for 35 years now. All right? 
And her latest book is actually quite cautionary. Her latest book is, the reason the title of the book is because she thinks that we're using technology as a substitute for human connection. And that it can often act in that way. And I'm reading this book because she had always been quite positive. And this is her moment where she's going, ah. And I actually hear this voice popping up from a lot of people that I trust, that I would read and that I would look to for my own guidance about where this is going. So I think the thing you can do is within your own self is you can approach these things psychoanalytically and say, okay, are these things feeding the parts of me that I want to see grow? Or are they feeding the parts of me that I would rather see extinguish? Are they helping me to connect in the real or are they excluding me from the real? All right. So there, there are tests that you can ask yourself that are more or less internal, or psychoanalytic tests. You can also ask an analyst to help you to get to the answers of these questions. And that they then can become, and as you do that, you can, become an, you can build an internal compass that will help you navigate your way through what will be an increasingly interesting set. Now, one of the things that I did want to talk about, and this cuts in right, we're at this middle point. Think of how kind of meh, mobile phones were five, six years ago as compared to, oh my God, there is so much fun and I just want to play with it all the time today. All right? The default social posture in 2011 when you're out in public is this. <laughs> but it is. All right? So they went from being use useful I mean, you could text people, but you didn't sort of have it in your hands all the time five years ago to now they're in your hands all the time. Think about what that's going to be like in five years' time. They aren't getting less alluring. They aren't getting less seductive. They aren't going to suddenly turn a corner and get boring again. And so we've let this demon into our midst. And it's up to us to figure out how to treat with the demon so that it doesn't take our soul in the bargain. Just, um, and just, just one last very quick thing. Um, do you see hive societies like ants and bees as being the, the uh, uh, extreme extension of, of this hyperconnectivity? I hope not. <laughs> um, human society, okay, for one thing, we don't, we don't regulate everything with um, pheromones. All right, whereas bee societies and ant societies do. So they, they have a very sort of endemic chemical regulation. We do it with packets. Um, so it's, it's not clear to me. I, I don't think that a hive culture or a human global mind looks anything like what the bees look like. That said, we are now, and I pointed this out, we are now coordinated at a level that simply wasn't, impo wasn't, wasn't possible a half a billion seconds ago. And we don't think about that. We just sort of stumbled into it. But we now have this very highly coordinated day-to-day -day activity with your friends and your family culture because we, we have, this, we have a, an external prosthesis that allows us to support that. It doesn't look like a beehive, but it does look very social. We're going to quickly grab one more it's final question. Simple, thought about or do you uh, foresee a time when the mobile will be wired into our brain? So the funny thing is that there was a slide that I was, I actually like the baby in the womb with the mobile better because I had a choice between the two of these. I'll tell you a little story. I have been working on these ideas and these ideas will essentially be my next book. The, next, the book's going to be called The Next Billion Seconds. With luck you'll see it in several months. Um, and when I started working on these ideas, I gave a little talk at a little science fiction convention in Melbourne because one of my friends had invited me to do it. And I was like, oh, let me take my crazy ideas out. And I did, did the talk. And after I finished the talk, a woman came up to me and she said, I cannot wait to have it implanted. I want the mobile implanted. <laughs> and I said, where's your mobile right now? She says, right here in my handbag. I said, OK, where is it when you sleep at night? She says, oh, it's on my bedstand." I said, when is it ever more than a meter away from your body? And she thinks she's, eh, never. And I said, and why do you need it implanted? <laughs> I think that's, uh, that's an appropriate note. We have run out of time. But um, I'd like to uh, 
thank, uh, on behalf of all of us here, uh, thank Mark Pesci for what's been a, a really wonderful presentation tonight. I think, true to the nature and example of the Royal Institution, we've got a lot of things to go away and think about, and we're certainly heading into the next half billion seconds with a bit of trepidation, um, but certainly I think with a lot of excitement as to where we're going. So would you please thank Mark Pesci.